Again, ready to get moving with our afternoon portion of the uh, irregularly scheduled program, or irregularly scheduled, um, but it's really great to have everybody in one place and to see the whole Emerald Cities family here. Um, so the afternoon we're going to have two panels, two forums uh, discussing the anatomy of an Emerald City and what better place to do it than in the Emerald City, if you haven't heard that one already yet over here, <laughs> past couple of days. Um, the first panel we're going to focus on um, policy, utilities, and public initiatives. It's going to be focused mostly on the, uh, the, the green side of, um, of the equation, but green somewhat broadly, mostly focused on energy, but thinking about you know, both the environmental and economic aspects of, of, um, of energy. Um, and uh, environment. So the we have we're going to do try to keep this kind of lively, and hopefully most of you will be um, participating along the way. We're going to have some relatively brief opening remarks. We're going to have a little bit of a structured conversation up here, and then I really do want to get the whole um, group of folks involved in the conversation. Um, so with that in mind, um, can folks just raise your hand? Who here is? Other than the folks up front, a Seattle person, a Seattleite, or someone who knows things about the Seattle world. All right, great. So, gonna want you guys to participate as well. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that's wonderful about Emerald Cities, and not just from a symbolic perspective, but because it's our value add, it's how we do work, is uh, the diversity of stakeholders who we have involved. So, I'm just curious for our panel and for others if you can just um, broadly group yourself into some sort of um, uh, uh, stakeholder group, um, who here is a, a workforce or a labor-oriented um, person or from such an organization? All right, and who here is um, uh, on kind of on the, the energy or environmental side of things? All right, and I like that Joel raises his hand for everything. This is good. Um, and how about business and philanthropy or... <laughs> All right, good. So a little bit of everything, and that's um, wonderful. I'll make sure we'd love your questions or your angle on all this as well. So um, with that, I just quickly want to introduce our panelists. We have four folks. Um, Christy Baumel, Christy Baumel, um, from uh, the Seattle Office of Sustainability and Environment, um, uh, and Dwayne Johnlin from the Seattle Office of Planning and Development, um, a building and energy code uh, specialist there. Um, Michael Mann from Cyan Strategies, and Kathleen Riddahall from the Sierra Club and the Washington Beyond Coal Campaign. So just as a way of framing our discussion, I uh, should have introduced myself at the very front, but I'm Eric Macris. I'm the local policy manager with ACEEE. Uh, ACEEE is the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy. We're based in DC, uh, we do policy and um, program research uh, related to energy efficiency all across the economy, all different sectors of it. Um, and we just recently released our the first edition of our City Energy Efficiency Scorecard. It's a report that looks at uh, what cities are doing, what actions they're taking, what policies or programs they have in place to improve energy efficiency um, in their communities. So it's, you know, specifically focused on energy efficiency, although I want our conversation today to be broader as well, to think about uh, um, energy and green economic development a little bit more broadly. Um, but the scorecard, uh, we included uh, 34 of the largest cities um, in the scorecard, as you can see here. Um, the, the overall results, um, the, uh, the, the top scoring cities are here, and Seattle did quite well. Um, number five overall, um, and it includes um, uh, metrics from across five different general policy categories, uh, initiatives in local government, community-wide initiatives, um, actions for energy efficiency in um, private buildings, uh, efforts of water and energy utilities to improve energy efficiency, and then um, transportation energy efficiency initiatives. Um, so, to talk a little bit more about Seattle, by, to frame our conversation, here are the high-level results for Seattle. Um, overall, ranked number five, 
Um, but we're going to focus our conversation today primarily on buildings and utilities, which um, are some of the, um, the, the highlights and the, um, the best practices where Seattle is really leading the way. Um, Seattle was the, the first ranked city in the buildings category um, with the best policies and programs in place among the cities we looked at, and also um, fourth in the, the water and energy utility section. Um, just a couple of highlights. You've already heard um, um, Michael talk about um, some of the, the high-level things that, that Seattle is going to do, and we're, our panel is going to get into it a little bit further. But in terms of why uh, the city scored as well as it did in our scorecard, um, a couple things to point out. The, the city's climate action plan, um, both with its focus on you know, community-wide action and local government action, um, has been uh, driving, um, driving activities policies in the city for quite a while now in the newest edition is going to um, up the game on that. Uh, the city has strong um, building codes and has done things to uh, adopt and improve building codes at the local level and has also been active at state and state level policy related to building energy codes. Um, the city is, is one of a growing number of, of cities that are, is adopting uh, building energy disclosure policies and requirements for buildings uh, to make transparent uh, energy use and to encourage better management of energy. Um, and it is uh, a strong and uh, has a strong and innovative utility in terms of designing energy efficiency programs, as we talk, heard about with the Pay for Performance initiative. Um, but not only that, uh, a legacy of, of uh, well managed and historically, um, you know, re relatively aggressive compared to the rest of the country um, on uh, energy efficiency programs from, uh, from Seattle City Light. So with that, I'm going to um, turn this over to our, our panel. Um, I, I'm hoping that each of you will discuss a little bit about, um, about Seattle, why you think what Seattle um, has achieved is important, and more importantly, what is the most important thing that, um, that Seattle has achieved so far from your perspective. Um, I want to also hear about um, what you think was essential in accomplishing it, how it got done, and then um, you know, finally, I want to focus most of our discussion after our remarks on what we need to do next, what's, what's the, the path forward. Um, but as a way to frame that in your initial remarks, if you can also just touch on you know, what are the largest challenges we still have ahead. And then I want to spend some time after those remarks brainstorming about what are some of the potential solutions and how are we going to get to, to implementing them. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christy. And um, Christy, tell us a little bit about your work and how it relates to these questions. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Christy Baumel, and I work with the city's Office of Sustainability and Environment. And what our best achievement to date is being born in third base. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of that really, I, I don't want to repeat what Councilmember O'Brien was talking about, but I think we, we benefit from a lot of early decisions. We own our own hydroelectric dams. We have really clean power because of it. We, um, it it's, it's not as large of a leap for our utility to say we're going to be carbon neutral because 80 some percent of our portfolio already was. You know, there, there are some early decisions that we continually benefit from. Um, and, and it, it, it um, allows us to um, you know, always start looking at, at the next, you know, the, what's on the horizon and, and how we can we keep moving forward. Um, a little bit about my office and what we do. So I think energy efficiency and the value for that is, is you'll see it throughout um, many departments. Um, Councilmember Bryan talked about City Light and the role they've played. You'll hear Dwayne talk about um, our planning department and our <coughs> strong energy codes through time. Our, uh, you know, we've, we've always had a lot of green building incentives and a, and a big focus on that. And we've looked at this um, much more from a, a point of view of carbon emissions. So <coughs> some of the things Councilmember O'Brien mentioned have fallen under our purview for that reason, the climate action planning, um, and, and also some kind of pushing the envelope, innovative steps that we'd like to try out and test to keep moving forward. So examples would be the Community Power Works program he mentioned or the Energy Benchmarking uh, program that he mentioned. 
and um, I, I'll, for the sake of being brief, I won't go into a lot of detail because he mentioned those already. But I want to talk a little bit in terms of, of kind of framing this, what we've done with the Climate Action Plan and what we're seeing there. Uh, obviously, carbon neutral is a pretty bold goal, and we, there are two ways to reduce the emissions in your buildings. You can use cleaner energy or you can use less of it. And we're trying to address all of that. And in looking at using less of it, we realize we've, we've, we've got a pretty strong and robust history of, of doing that with new construction. Strong energy codes, green building incentives, priority permitting, there's a lot going on there. A big toolbox, a lot of tools we've employed. Existing buildings is harder. It's and it's newer. We don't. It, it's kind of this new nut we have to figure out how to crack, and it's really important. I think 80%. And this is a national figure, not local, but they say 80% of the buildings we're going to be looking at in 2050 have already been built. So policies that affect what new development comes into our city will only take us so far. We really got to figure out how to look in a very new and very deep way at our existing building stock. We need, you know, our utilities have done a great job, but we need to take it to a whole other level and, and figure out how to do that. Um, we think of it as kind of policies that fall into four key areas. There are informational programs, incentives, assistance programs, performance requirements, and it's kind of like recipes of a cake. They, they, they support and enforce each other, and you're just not going to get the same results if you don't have all of them. You can't just make a cake without the sugar is not going to be very good. You, you, you need them all. So um, informational programs, some things that are on our horizon that we're going to be looking at in the short term. Um, home energy disclosure. So we, for, we do have the, the benchmarking policy for our, our larger buildings. Um, but how about our homes? You know, we would never buy a car without asking what the miles per gallon is. But we haven't done that yet on our homes, so we're working on that. Incentives, taking um, the pay for performance that Council Member O'Brien talked about and, and continually pushing that forward. Um, assistance, there's financing, you know, access to financing. And, and um, in the single family market, we've discovered that if we can kind of have wraparound services like the hand holding to help usher somebody through, that helps a lot. Performance requirements, um, well, the energy code is the most obvious one, but thinking more and more what this looks like on an existing building instead of just on new construction or something. So a building that's you know, maybe not at the point of going through a permit process. We've talked about um, how do we build off our benchmarking program. Right now, it's collect the information. How does that grow over time? Do we publicly share the information?